nobile qual più mal vento mutara cento e ripensiero sempre un amabile legge addroviso in pianto in riso e ben sognero la donna immobile qual più mal vento mutara cento eri pensier eri pensier
Jack, I've watched your interaction with students here in two master classes at Ball State, and I understand you wanted to become a teacher, and I think if you had, you would have become as great in the teaching field as you are in the <laughs> operatic field. That's very kind. Uh, you enjoy this interaction with students. Oh, yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, as you know, uh, one of the interviews that I had wanted to do, I wanted to have the cameras into the school, and it didn't work out that way, so uh, we were able to to get together a kind of class to work with them so that I could do some of my work in front of the people. I, I feel like, um, you know, I, I don't have much to say to a camera for a camera's sake. Uh, if there are people out there who are watching this or are listening to it that get something from this or are just merely entertained by it, that's fabulous. And my real interaction comes when there are people right there with me that I can see the expression of their faces and I can really play with and off of that. And, uh, they give me a lot of energy, so you just channel that back through and give it back to them. I noticed that when we asked you to sing uh, a number we're going to close our interview with, the one about the dragon, yes. you asked if you could have an audience, right. and, and the interaction is beautiful to watch. Well, especially with that song, it's, 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 uh, it's, um, I bill it as a lullaby, of course it's anything but a lullaby. It's, um, it's an old piece written in the 20s. Um, a, ch a children's piece, really. But the great thing about it is, is it brings out the child in all of us, and that's what we're really, that's what we're really speaking to if we're talking about entertainment. And it's the song that I close my uh, formal recital with. I, I don't close it with it. It's one of the encores. And it's always, uh, it's always a lot of fun for me and the audiences, too. In talking with the students, you've emphasized the importance of acting in an operatic role. And we didn't have this emphasis years ago. It was always on the voice. Yes. Well, um, the art of singing and the art of operatic singing is an extremely demanding um, form. And I think people really took time out and really looked at that art carefully and studied it carefully for a long period of time. Uh, it's interesting because nowadays young singers want to go out and they want to be there now. And they simply haven't had the kinds of training that's necessary for that to happen. And I think that in the um, past, the singers really said, I'm a singer, opera is about music, I must sing and, pr and serve that music. And they felt the best way to do that was to sing the best way possible. Now with the advent of television and uh, this mass communication and movies, uh, people, the audiences go to a television or, or, or sit in front of their television go to a movie, and they see much more realistic acting. Uh, they're really in tune with the fact that people are natural as actors, and they expect that from the operatic stage. And if you're going to keep an audience uh, in the day when audiences don't have to leave their house, if you're going to get them to the theater, you have to at least get, uh, give them what they expect and what they've come to be accustomed to. As one of the major stars of the New York City Opera, you have seen, I'm sure, that uh, uh, group develop into uh, really uh, one of the, uh, the great entertainment uh, groups in New York City. Yes, that opera company has always been geared toward the singing actor. Um, and as the years have gone by, and even and now especially I think with the change of um, the regime there with Beverly Sills, um, it has become even more involved in that area. And I, I think it's simply um, keeping up with the times, I really do, but it's a fine group and they really do. They bring in wonderful directors and conductors who will allow that to take place and still want to make music with it and it's a wonderful uh, combination. How do you get along with Beverly Sills and how do you view her? Great. I get along very well with her. Um, we almost signed together in Houston doing The Merry Widow and there were a series of events that took place that uh, didn't permit that. And uh, I don't know whether you saw the recent production of the Carmen that I did on Live from Lincoln Center, but we were interviewed, I was interviewed by her then. And uh, we often talk about, uh, it's too bad that we weren't able to sing together, because for one thing, she's quite tall. And um, it seems that during the time when she was singing, there was a dearth of, of shorter tenors, and that she always was having to scrunch, you know, to keep shorter than the tenors. And I think she got kind of a thing going about that. And she said, for nothing else, just so you'd be taller than me. But she, she was an actress, and she knows that that's my love, and that I think we could have done some wonderful things together. Does she occasionally perform? 
Not really, no. She's, she was really retired and, uh, you know, you have your hands full running a company of that kind, especially with the kind of media attention that it gets. And she does a lot of wonderful things for charities and, and so she, she's got herself real busy. You talked about preparation and background mm -hmm. for becoming successful right. in your field. And <clears throat> I noted in one of your master classes you told the students that when you went to New York, you didn't take the usual busboy jobs or cook jobs or whatever and the side jobs of performing, uh, that you think it's important to dedicate yourself to the performance. All right, I really do. Um, it's not to say that those people who have gone to New York and chosen a different way to get there are not doing the right thing for them. Uh, I felt that I was going to lose focus if I went to New York as a, as a young singer and um, got a job waiting tables or busing tables or the numerous kinds of things, you could office work, uh, as a way to pay for lessons and things like that. Uh, I would have rather have done with a few less lessons and always kept my focus on the fact that I was a singer and that I was trying to become a better singer. And so I took all singing jobs. Fortunately, I was offered enough to make a living, but it got pretty slim. I mean, I remember ketchup soup and, and saltines, you know. Um, not a lot, but an, enough, to, enough to know that that's not where I want to go again. <laughs> and uh, so it, it helped me to maintain a clear focus for what my goal was. How did Ball State help prepare you for this? I'm not sure that a university can really do that. Um, I think that's something that perhaps comes more from your, uh, from your upbringing, um, from kind of parental guidance that gives you, um, that keeps you kind of goal oriented and that keeps you understanding how the world works and the ups and downs of the world so that you can uh, live through the discouraging times that exist. and. Um, I, I think that that's simple, uh, what, what Ball State or any university does at that point is simply provide a part of the world uh, for you and there are ups and downs here, you know, just like every place else and you begin to become an adult in a university situation. It does provide a background though in uh, allowing you uh, to perform in university productions and so forth as far oh, as your sure. career is concerned. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No, there's, there's no doubt about that. At the time that I was here, uh, I don't know how many, I named some of the productions that I took part in and I don't know, I've never counted how many there were. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it doesn't please me to say it, but I, I'm sure that some of my work really slipped because I was doing so much in, in the performing end of it. And I was lucky that I had some teachers who understood and would take me aside and help me get through some of the things I needed. In other words, uh, they, they really got that my focus and my energy was about performing. And there were some wonderful people on the faculty now, and I'm sure there are here at this point, um, that just were so understanding and really took me by the hand and said, hey, let me give you some extra work on this stuff so you can get through it, because I know you're busy doing this other kind of work. So they understood where my focus was. And of course, I think that's the job of any good uh, learning institution, is to really be in tune with the students and try to help them get through whatever their avenue is. As far as your career orientation is concerned, do you look beyond opera roles, uh, television, films, so forth? It's um, something that I think is probably occupies a tiny space in your mind always. I mean, you're always looking to the future even though you realize that now is where it's at. And um, I do feel that whatever I'm meant to do later on will come to me if I really put my focus and energies in what I'm doing now. Uh, there's not a whole lot of planning that I can do. I do what I'm doing, I enjoy doing it, I want to continue doing it for as long as that enjoyment lasts. At that time, I really have faith that whatever it is that I'm supposed to go to next will be opened up to me. And I've certainly thought about the possibilities, and they, one of the things I enjoy a lot is the idea of directing, of stage directing. And since I've had a lot of experience in opera and am particularly acting oriented, I think that I might be something I do very well. Of course, there's always the business of teaching voice. And certainly, 
there is a great need for good voice teachers in the world today. And so those are just two of the possibilities, and there are numerous ones that I could mention but won't. Do you have a favorite role, operatic role? Usually the role I'm singing is my favorite one. I, th I really think that that's because of my idea about keeping so, so much focus on it. It's very difficult for me to learn another role while I'm performing a role because it just divides me. I just feel totally s uh, split, and I don't like that feeling as you're probably getting from this interview. Uh, so, and if I really stop and clarify that, I, the, of course the role of Don Jose, or Don Jose if you're talking French, uh, in Carmen is a, is a wonderful role. Many people, myself included, feel that opera should be named Don Jose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a wonderful acting role and, a, and a, just a fine singing role. Uh, Pique Dame, the role of German, the Tchaikovsky opera. Uh, I just finished the coronation of Popea, which is the first time I've done the role of Nero. And I had just a, a great time doing that. A, a Monteverdi, some uh, you know, 16th century music, it's the first time I'd done that. So those are just a few. Are you preparing now for a performance? Several. Um, I, I'm actually, as, as you get really involved in what's happening here, I'm looking ahead to doing The Merry Widow in San Diego. Uh, after that, um, I go back to New York and spend about five weeks preparing um, Alva in Lulu, the Alban Berg opera. I'm going to Florence, Italy to do the f first time the three-act version has been done in Florence. And um, after that, I come back and go, go to New York City Opera and repeat the Carmen that I did in the broadcast. And also, I'm up for a new broadcast of La Rondine, a Puccini kind of operetta that he did. After that, to San Francisco to do Lear and, uh, you know, oh, not to no string no. this out. Yes. Good. Uh, have you performed in Europe? Yes. Uh, I was at the Spoleto Festival in Spoleto, Italy. Um, I've sung in England and Wales and in London. And, uh, of course, going back now to go to Florence and Vienna. Do you find European audiences more critical and, then again, more responsive? Yeah, I think maybe they go hand in hand sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, and not necessarily. Uh, certainly the Italian audiences are very critical of their native music, of the Puccini and Verdi. I mean, they, they know every word, they know every phrase, they know how, how they think it should go, and they're very critical. If you don't get it the way, it, then you, you're very likely to find some, you know, uh, strange flying object coming your way. That's literal, let me do yes, that. Yes, uh, yes, and certainly there have been a number of singers that have been booed off the stage. Uh, and then recently, you know, La Scala and some of the smaller houses. It speaks well for you that you haven't been. That you are <laughs> performing the way they like. <laughs> well, I haven't been booed off the stage. Fortunately, I, uh, for me, I think, I do a lot of unknown works there. I mean, or, or little known. The Shostakovich uh, Lady Macbeth of Mazintz district. Uh, they just love that piece. They like good acting. And so I've, I've been fortunate to the peak dom. They really like the Tchaikovsky. Good. So. Thank you very much for sharing your life with us. You're very welcome. I, I appreciate being able to be here.